Who, who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth? Uh, shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb? Saith, saith thy God, rejoice ye with Jerusalem and be glad with her. All ye that love her, rejoice for joy with her, all, the that, all ye that mourn for her, that ye may suck and be satisfied with the breast of her consolations, that ye may milk out and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then shall he suck, he shall be born upon her sides, and be dandled upon her knees. As one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you, and ye shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And when ye see this, your heart shall rejoice, and your bones shall flourish like an herb, and the hand of the Lord shall be known toward his servants, and his indignation toward his enemies. So this entire passage is a prophecy to the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel, their promised restoration, that the Jews will be able to return and become a nation once more. But the Bible also says that the Gentiles, that they'll be able to be, they'll be able to be, uh, they'll, they will be able to be blessed. Okay, a lot of B's right there. <laughs> they'll be blessed because of their connection to the nation of Israel. If they were able to be connected to the nation of Israel, join her side, be able to be an aid to her, God will in return bless the Gentiles. So we are coming now to this point in our history. Remember the Jewish people, they had no nation. I covered that historical time. I've covered how during the Dark Ages, that's the last time where we left off the Jews, that they were wandering all throughout Europe. Uh, they were living among Muslim populated nations as well as Catholic populated nations. And their city, Jerusalem, has just been a bloody conquest from the Byzantine Empire, from the Catholic Empire, as well as through... Uh, the Muslim nation. So it was a huge mess, the Jews. They went through a lot of turmoil and a lot of trouble. They could have been wiped out a million times over, but that group of people has somehow survived and continued no matter what, which is very, very strange. They always continued. They always continued. So what has become of the Jewish people, one, and uh, so what has become of the Jewish people? And secondly, uh, where are they at? Where are they at? Uh, what is the connection of the Gentiles helping them out? So we shall cover our world history class. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to, I have a lot of books to read. So that's why, that's why I only brought two, because I took pictures of the other ones, because it's just too thick. So I'm going through a lot of sources here today. So I want you to follow along as best as you can. So first things first is, uh, let's go back to the round table. Remember the Round Table by Cecil Rhodes. They're a group of strange elites that follow the similar pattern to Weishaupt's Illuminati and to the Jesuits. Very strange when you study elites throughout history, they always want to follow a Jesuit pattern. Very strange. And I've also given you quotes on that, that Cecil Rhodes, that his, uh, his goal, that his vision was to follow the system of the Jesuit order. And they've done infiltration, they've done strange things to be able to control the world and to start up natural catastrophes. So I'm going to read uh, page 436 from Dr. William Grady's book, How Satan Turned America Against God. Carol Quigley, remember he's the professor from Georgetown and a uh, scholar on history, so his work is very trusted. The quotation from Quigley is as follows concerning about the group, round table. So remember Cecil Rhodes, Milner, they're all connected. It is clear from these lists that almost every important member of the Milner group, that's a round table, was a fellow of one of the three colleges. 
So I'm going to butcher some pronunciations right here. Baliol and then New College or All Souls. Indeed, these three formed a close relationship. The first two on the undergraduate level and the last in its own unique position. The three were largely dominated by the Milner Group. So notice how they were infecting colleges. Kind of similar to Weishaupt. Remember, he wanted to infiltrate the educated groups and the colleges. And they in turn, uh, and they in turn largely dominated the intellectual life of Oxford in the fields of law, history, and public affairs. That's pretty scary. That's pretty scary. They came close to dominating the university itself in administrative matters. Wow, how about that? The relationship among the three can be demonstrated by the proportions of all souls fellows who came from these two colleges in relation to the numbers which came from the other 18 colleges, Oxford or from the outside world, of the 149 fellows at all souls in the 20th century, 48 came from Balliol and 30 from New College in spite of the fact that Christ Church was larger than these and Trinity, Magdalene, and Brasinos, St. John's, and university colleges were almost as large. Only 32 came from these other large colleges, while at least 15 were educated outside Oxford. So it shows their tentacles, how far it reached among the intellectual life, among the intellectual world. They also infiltrated the Times. So that's a newspaper source. So they're able to brainwash the people through the newspaper. Quigley, uh, page 438 from Grady's book, Quigley illustrates how the Times could be manipulated to fashion public opinion. In reference to the Boer War fiasco, he writes, it was the Times that published as an exclusive feature the famous and fraudulent Women and Children Letter, dated 20th of December, 1895, which pretended to be an appeal for help from the persecuted British in the Transvaal to J Jameson's waiting forces, but which had been really concocted by Dr. Jameson himself on 20th November and sent to Miss Shaw a month later. This letter was published by the Times as soon as news of the Jameson raid was known as a justification of the act. Okay, in other words, there's an event that happened. So they infel infiltrated the Times uh, newspaper and also Oxford University. The Jameson Raid is a true historical event, and every historical source will admit it. But basically, it's a botched up raid where they pretended, where they pretended to be heroes and that uh, the, uh, the Cecil Rhodes owned people can start up a riot and be able to conquer um, more of the foreigners' territory, the other nation's territory, because Cecil Rhodes wanted to build up his kingdom. But I'll explain that one a little later. Let's continue on with the Times, how much their tentacles reach them. Dr. Grady writes, although the Times had a limited circulation, only about 35,000 at the beginning of the century, 50,000 at the outbreak of the First World War, and 187,000 in 1936, it was considered the most influential paper in England because of its exclusive readership. So it's very elitist. You see that? It's very elitist, their reach through the public uh, news reading as well as the intellectual life. Carol Quigley continues to write, This influence was not exercised by acting directly on public opinion since the Milner Group Roundtable never intended to influence events by acting through any instruments of mass propaganda, but rather hoped to work on the opinions of the small group of important people who in turn could influence wider and wider circles of persons. This was the basis on which the Milner Group itself was constructed." End of quote. Dr. Grady writes this, as with their acquisition of the Dictionary of National Biography through Oxford, the group, the group roundtable, also gained control of the acclaimed Encyclopedia Britannica through the Times. 
So notice right here that these elites, they put their hands to everything. A lot of the stuff that you'll be reading nowadays, you might be surprised, is infiltrated already, already with the round table's thinking, which is similar to the pattern of the Illuminati. Very strange stuff. Very strange stuff and also very disturbing. Now, the Jameson Raid. Okay, what is that? So this is from Wikipedia itself. So anyone can pull up uh, the source of this uh, event. The Jameson Raid, which was on 29th of December 1895 to 2nd of January 1896, was a botched raid against the South African Republic, commonly known as the Transvaal, carried out by British colonial administrator Leander Starr Jameson under the employment of Cecil Rhodes. It involved 500, 500 British South Africa Company police launched from Rhodesia over, over the New Year weekend of 1895 to 96. Paul Kruger, towards whom Rhodes had a great personal hatred, was president of the South African Republic at the time. The raid was intended to trigger an uprising by the primarily British expatriate workers known as the Ute, uh, Wheatlanders, I think, in the Transvaal, but failed to do so. The workers were called the Johannesburg Conspirators. They were expected to recruit an army and prepare for an insurrection. However, the raid was ineffective and no uprising took place. The results included embarrassment of the British government, the replacement of Cecil Rhodes as Prime Minister of the Cape Colony, and the strengthening of Boer dominance of the Transvaal and its gold mines. The raid was a contributory cause of the Anglo-Boer War, 1899 to 1902. So basically, with, uh, with, the thing, uh, with what happened at Johannesburg and Cecil Rhodes, he was responsible for the war. Notice that elitists are responsible for causing wars. You see that? Yeah. Elites are responsible for causing wars. And this is a real historical event that not even the secular or popular historians can ignore. This is a real event. Things like this do occur. Things like this do occur where elites, they put a hand upon society and try to start uprisings, start, try to start wars and their own thing. So this is what we do know about the round table. Now the big thing about the round table that we also know is the Balfour Declaration, which is a huge issue. People who get into conspiracies and who study about the dark elites and what they uh, done, you can't separate Jews there. You always see mention of Jews here and there when tied to elites. So then, People who studied about the round table, the Balfour Declaration, or the restoration of the nation of Israel, they will claim that that is a satanic conspiracy and the devil was behind it, not the Lord. Now, the simple answer is this. The simple answer is no, the Lord is behind it because of Scripture. We saw that. The Lord promised that His nation of Israel, that they will be restored. And that the Gentile nations who are supportive of it, that he will bless them for their efforts. So that's scriptural. Well, then why do you see satanic elites right there? The easy answer to that is wherever the hand of the Holy Spirit moves, don't, I mean, the, the devil will follow along in there. The devil will follow along because he wants to take a part of that. He wants to corrupt it. When did the devil's hand was ever absent wherever the Holy Spirit moved? Come on. I mean, it's like a dog question. So just because you see satanic forces behind it, don't attribute everything as the devil. You got to be careful of that. We know that the devil corrupted Bibles today, but that doesn't mean that uh, the King James Bible is corrupted. But people would like to get into that because of the Mandela effect and all that kind of stuff. So that's what they get into. They see satanic hands with, behind Christianity as it grew. So then all the liberals and scholars assume that Christians were the one butchering people during the Dark Ages. See, don't confuse the Catholics with the genuine Christians. See, whenever they see something dark or evil or satanic behind the Lord's movement, they automatically attribute that to everything. They automatically attribute the evil and Satanism to everything, which is why you got to be careful. You can't really fall into that, and you got to be careful of that. Okay, so now we come to the Balfour Declaration. There is no doubt the round table had hands behind it. 
So then why is it that we believe that the Lord's hand was behind this, but that their hand followed along with it? Why did they infiltrate that? That's what we believe. So I'm going to explain to you something that's eye-opening. Believe it or not, the round table, they're more into the Jews not getting their homeland. Yeah. One. Number two, they actually uh, were siding more with what they called the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not. So then you get these anti-Semite people getting into conspiracies and they're all siding with the poor Palestinians, they'll call it. And then try to make the Jews demonize because, no, the Jews, uh, they, shouldn't have their they shouldn't have sovereignty of the entire nation of Israel because the Palestinians were there and they're just trying to kick them out of their homeland. They don't know their history. Yeah. They don't know their history. So this is a book from Holy Ground. Holy Ground will give a lot of detail and explanation about the history. So I'll explain very thoroughly about everything that's going on. Now, do I deny that there is mistreatment of Palace, uh, Palestinians? Sure, there is mistreatment of them, but I hesitate to use the term Palestinian. That doesn't really apply to them. Number two is uh, there's mistreatment on both sides of the fence, no matter what. Unless you get God who will take control of the entire terrain, then you'll get fair treatment. So uh, the Jews are not without their faults. They do have it. However, uh, let me explain one by one everything what's going on. That way uh, people don't have a misunderstanding. So first let's go through uh, Dr. Grady's book called Holy Ground. He's got a lot of good stuff over here that I highly recommend. Now first thing is let's see the round table. Arnold J. Toynbee, you remember him? I mentioned that was the guy, Toynbee was the one who said he wanted a new world order. He is the guy who was with the round table, Professor Ruskin's group and Cecil Rhodes. If you forgot his name, then go back to my previous discipleship. I mentioned his name, Arnold J. Toynbee. Anyway, this is what he said. Arnold J. Toynbee uh, presented the myth of a displaced Palestinian nation in his foreword to the Palestine, uh, Palestine Diary by co-authors Robert John and Sami Hadawi in page 11. Okay, so because there's just a lot of uh, different uh, languages and terms here, I'm going to butcher pronunciation. So just excuse me on that. That way I can just read through here. The story is a tragedy, and the essence of this tragedy is that about 1,500,000 Palestinian Arabs have now become refugees as a result of the intervention of foreign powers in their country's affairs. The might of these foreign powers have been irresistible, and the evicted Palestinian Arabs have been forcibly deprived of their country, their homes, and their property without having been allowed to have a voice in the determination of their own destiny. The tragedy in Palestine is not just a local one, it is a tragedy for the world because it is an injustice that is a menace to the world's peace. That's what Toynbee from the round table insisted. This is an interference to their world peace, to their new world order setup. So people who get into uh, that kind of stuff about conspiracy and no, the Jews are evil. They're the ones that set all this up. They don't, they didn't really read about the elites. But anyway, this is from uh, Dr. Grady, he mentions on page 11, the reader will recall from volume one of this, ser of this series that his uncle, also named Arnold Toynbee, was the undisputed intellectual philosophical leader among Professor Ruskin's inner circle at Oxford University, eventually forming the Toynbee group in the Cecil Rhodes Alfred Milner cabal. How about that? Okay, now explaining about the so-called Palestinian nation. I do not believe in calling them Palestinians because if you studied history, the Arab people even rejected that term Arab. I mean, Hollywood even had the movie called Lawrence of Arabia. And these groups, you got to realize, they didn't want to be associated with terms that Westerners called them. They had, because it was so, it was, they weren't their own nation. They were all their own tribes. It was very scattered. There was no such thing as a huge Arab nation or a Palestinian nation. They were all their own groups, their tribes. They're all scattered. It's hardly called a nation. So let me explain even more. This is on page 12. 
Bernard Lewis, Cleveland E. Dodge Professor Emeritus of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University, is a preeminent authority on the history of Islam. Dr. Lewis confirms on the history of Islam. Quote, from the end of the Jewish state in antiquity to the beginning of British rule, the area now designated by the name Palestine was not a country and had no frontiers, only administrative boundaries. It was a group of province, uh, provincial subdivisions, by no means always the same within a larger entity. End of quote. See, they don't really read and study their history. Here's another one. Uh, from Dr. Grady, page 14. Ephraim Karsh is a professor and director of the Mediterranean Studies program at, uh, program at King's College London. He has held various academic posts at Columbia, Harvard, Helsinki, and Tel Aviv universities, as well as the Sorbonne and the London School of Economics. He has published extensively on Middle Eastern affairs and Soviet foreign policy. Dr. Karsh prescribes uh, excuse me, describes the political structure of the Palestinian nation on the eve of World War I. Quote, Palestine did not exist as a unified geopolitical entity. It was divided between the Ottoman province of Beirut in the north and the district of Jerusalem in the south. Its local inhabitants, like the rest of the Arabic-speaking communities throughout the region, viewed themselves as subjects of the Ottoman Empire rather than as members of a wider Arab nation bound together by a shared language, religion, history, or culture. Would you, would you believe that? They considered themselves as part of the Ottoman Empire. No such thing as Palestine. So if you recall in our world history discipleship class, let me remind you and fresh review about the Ottoman Empire. Remember the Byzantine Empire? Uh, let's rewind a bit here. Remember the Byzantine Empire, which is a split from Roman Empire. Go back all the way in the beginning of history. Roman Empire, during the time of, the time of Christ and the nation of Israel, Roman Empire increased and spread throughout the land, but then they split in half. Remember that? Split in half. Western Roman Empire, that's what the Roman Catholics dominated. And then the Eastern Roman Empire is the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire, like I told you, was very powerful. It's amazing how they survived. They were stronger than the Roman Catholic Empire. You recall that? So they were so powerful that they survived Genghis Khan's raid. They were able to survive so many uh, invasions and conquests and enemies and Muslim invasions. However, it was the Turks that finally overthrew the Byzantine Empire. The Turks, they, remember, they come from the Ottoman Empire eventually, how they were able to conjoin them in the scene conquered the Byzantine Empire. If you recall, the Byzantine Empire had its paws in some places in Jerusalem, the Holy Land, okay? So the Ottoman Empire, the Muslims who were able to conquer the Byzantine Empire, they were eventually able to conquer what's called Palestine at that time, okay? Palestine. So they were able to conquer Palestine, and then the Ottoman Turks were able to own the nation of Israel. So that's what must be understood. That's what must be understood. Okay. So that's what we understand so far from the history of Palestine. And then I'm going to give you something, uh, some more interesting stuff from uh, Dr. Grady here about the history of uh, so-called Palestine, which is, to be honest, it's not Palestine. It's Israel. It's Israel because God called it that at the beginning of Genesis, his promise, his oath to Abraham. It must be left as thus. The director of the prestigious ESCO Foundation for Palestine comments on this observation. Quote, students of Arab life are somewhat troubled in attempting to define what constitutes this essential likeness. They are agreed that the Arabs do not comprise a distinct race or a homogenous stock. How about that? Uh, one of the reasons for Islam's rapid spread, if you remember your history, how did, they, uh, how did these people become Muslims, if you recall your history, right? Through conquest, remember that? For, uh, for Islam's rapid spread is undoubtedly its complete disregard of the color line. In the term Arab, there is a sense of uh, 
consanguinity, whatever, but it is sy symbolic rather than actual. The amount of pure Arab blood among the people commonly classed as Arab today is insignificant. That's huge. This is from the director of the prestigious ESCO Foundation for Palestine. You got to recall that, okay? People don't study history. What did you know about that? From news media. That's what you've heard from news media, from today's modern generation. That's as far as history that you know about the so-called Palestines. They, don't tell, they tell you history from recent times. They don't tell you history from all the way back. Do we deny recent times history? No. There's mistreatment and unfairness on both sides of the fence. That's why God has to come down, set up his kingdom, set things right. But don't ignore the whole part of history and especially Genesis history. Yeah, that's good. See, people want to tell you revisionist history. Their own times, their own perception of history. They don't give you the full scope. I'm giving you the full scope of history from our Genesis class and right now. Now, let me tell you something interesting. This is from page 18. The first official usage of Palestine. You know where that came from? Began with the Romans. In the bloody wake of the Bar Kokhba uh, revolt in AD 135. Intent on removing all traces of Judaism. Why didn't that work today? Yep. See, the enemy of Christianity and Israel all this time has always been Rome. Yep. They've succeeded where they changed our history. Yeah. Roman Empire. Never changed. Let's see. Read, let's keep reading right here. Uh, Emperor Hadrian renamed Judea, the main Jewish principality, Palestina. He also changed Jerusalem to Alia Capitoli Capitolina while banning circumcision, the Sabbath, the law, even Judaism itself. How about that? Where, did you learn that? Did they tell you that in class? This is like new news to you, isn't it? No, this is old. Yeah. Old history. <laughs> Ironically, in view of the new appellation, Jews who fled these repressive measures became the first true Palestinian refugees. <laughs> Can I re let me read that again. Was that over your head? D Dr. Grady writes, Ironically, in view of the new appellation, Jews who fled these repressive measures became the first true Palestinian refugees. Does that make any sense to you? It was Roman persecution. And by the way, it's not done. It will be Roman persecution, the tribulation again. See, doesn't the history repeat prophecy? They go hand in hand, prophecy and history. People don't study nowadays. Dr. Ruckman writes, I mean, excuse me, Dr. Ruckman, Dr. Grady writes, excuse me, page 20. All right, I'm sure he appreciated that compliment. I don't know. Page 20, page 20. This is interesting. The actual historic residents of Palestine have comprised an uh, a mixture of Arabs, Greeks, Franks, Turks, Germans, Syrians, Hungarians, Scots, Kurds, Circassians, Egyptians, Bretons, Algerians, Indians, Georgians, Bulgarians, Persians, Russians, Danes, Bosnians, Latins, Matawias, Tartars, Sudanese, Jews, and a few Americans as well. The oldest inhabitants being identified in scripture as Canaanites, Amalekites, Jebusites, Amorites, Moabites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, Edomites, and of course the Philistines. The ninth, how about that? That's a lot. Okay, there's no such thing after all this evidence as a Palestinian. Yeah. There is no such thing. It's just too many groups of people here. There's no such thing. This is interesting. <laughs> The 1911 Encyclopedia Britannica cited no less than how many? 50 spoken languages in Palestine by that time. Wow. And you, you say there's a pure Palestinian, <laughs> you're crazy. You don't know your history. With the 1931 census listing how many? 60. It went up. It went up. Don't say there's such a thing called pure Palestinian blood, pure Palestinian language, pure, there's no such thing. Page 21, Loftus and Aaron's comment on this 
heroic endurance. So this is very interesting. People assume it's the Palestinians that should own the land, right? Because that's their territory. Why? Well, weren't the Jews the original people? Well, because the Jews left their land. That's why. No! There were Jews still staying there. They don't tell you that. They don't tell you that. The original Jews, there were still original Jews staying and residing there. So look, they still have first dibs on their homeland. The reason why so-called Palestinians are there is because it's called history. So many groups of people were moving in later on. But the Jews were always there. Did they tell you that? No. All right. This is from uh, this passage here. Page 21. Loftus and Aaron's comment on this heroic endurance. Quote, there have always been Jews living in Palestine. During Roman times, they numbered in the millions before they were dispersed by force around the Mediterranean basin. By the 19th century, there were perhaps 50,000 left, principally in the holy city of Jerusalem, where they formed a slight majority from about 1800 onward. The Arabs called them the dead ones and, and mistreated them. How about that? <clears throat> they don't tell you that one. So is there mistreatment on so-called Palestinians? Yeah, but they don't tell you about the Jews. You know what? That, that's called human nature. Everybody mistreats each other. Yeah. Jews who wished to pray at the Wailing Wall were forced to enter through the dung gate of the old city used for the dumping of human waste. Wow. Wow. They, know, they don't tell you that. Though traditionally predisposed to Arab demands, HMG acknowledged the historical reality of Eretz Yisrael. One of the more candid affirmations of the Jewish claim was articulated in the formal, guess what, Palestine Royal Commission Report presented to Parliament in 1937. Okay, this is big. You want to hear this? Quote, Always, or almost always, since the fall of the Jewish state, some Jews have been living in Palestine. Wow. Did they pull up that document to you? Mm -hmm. When's your last liberal scholar doing that, right? Under Arab rule, there were substantial Jewish communities in the chief towns. In the period of the Crusades and again in the Mongol invasions, there were nearly but not entirely blotted out. Even during the Crusades and Genghis Khan's Mongol invasions. They don't tell you this. Under Ottoman rule, remember the Ottomans took it over, right? They slowly recovered. Fresh immigrants arrived from time to time, from Spain in the 16th century. Remember the Jews? They were all over Europe and persecuted uh, within Catholic and Muslim territories there. Oh, by the way, the Muslims treated them, uh, the Jews better than the Catholics during that time. They don't tell you that part. All right, but anyway. From Eastern, it, yeah, can you imagine? <laughs> All right, but uh, I read that from, if, go, rewind from our world history class. I told you that. I told you that from our world history class a long time ago. How about that? Then they also immigrated from Eastern Europe in the 17th century. They settled mainly in Galilee, in numerous villages spreading northwards to the Lebanon and in the towns of Safad and Tiberias. There was no schism between those Jews in Galilee and the Muslim and Christian peasants amongst whom they lived. They were equally exposed to the raids of tribesmen. See, it's a bunch of tri tribesmen all coming from nowhere and everywhere. These inroads multiplied as public security deteriorated. Galilee steadily declined. A hundred years ago, there were only some 4,000 Jews in Safad and some 3,000 in Tiberias. But small though their numbers were, the continued existence of those Jews in Palestine meant much to all Jewry. Yeah, that that's their homeland. All right? And people who says, oh, I dig into truth. I'm a truther. And if you teach that the Jews should get their homeland, you're deceived by the wicked one. You're so deceived by the wicked one already. The elites wanted that. And I'll give you quotes on that. And you're so blind, you don't even know your history. All right, let's keep reading right here. Multitudes of poor and ignorant Jews in the ghettos of Eastern Europe 
felt themselves represented, as it were, by this remnant of their race who were keeping a foothold in the land against the day of the coming Messiah. That's right. That's what the scripture prophesied. They will remain until their Messiah comes, second advent. The Jew is evidence. The, them living in that homeland is evidence. Their nation, continuing on, is evidence that that Bible is true. There is no other nation from the B.C.s that done that. No other nation, you got to realize. This is unheard of. Where also they're, uh, they're facing so much annihilation, persecution. What other group? There's no doubt that book is true after you read that. All right. Okay, I got a lot. Okay, if I want to cover all this and get over here, I got to read quickly. All right. Citing England's greatest jurisprudence authority, LFL Oppenheim's international law. All right, so they should know international law, what they should say about the land. You know what it says right here? According to the principles of international law, the Jews have not lost their rights. Though they were deprived of their land by the Roman conquest, but though the doctrine of international law, strangely enough, admits the legality of conquest, listen, the authorities agree that it is subject to certain conditions. The conqueror must have been in continuous and undisturbed possession for a considerable time. But as long as other powers keep up protests and claims the actual exercise of sovereignty is not undisturbed. The Jews have never renounced their rights. <laughs> On the contrary, they have always maintained their protest and claims in the strongest possible form. To maintain the claim to Palestine became a religious duty, and every practicing Jew proclaims it at least twice a year on the occasion of the Passover and on the Day of Atonement. Yeah. <laughs> did, did they thought about that? When he expresses the hope of observing those days as a free man next year in Jerusalem. The Jews have not even confined themselves to acts of faith, hope, and protest. Over and over again, they have tried to return to their homeland individually and collectively, and in spite of persecution and oppression, there has always been at least a small Jewish population in Palestine. In the teachings of their religious and philosophical leaders, in the works of their poets, the longing for Palestine, and the certainty of once more returning and establishing there a reign of peace and freedom has found most touching expression. Now, is that it, it, convincing enough? Dr. Grady, uh, I, I dropped a lot of quotes. You can go, you can buy this book and read it for yourself. They don't, they don't study. They don't study. But there's just so much evidence, and I don't have time to go through all of that. So that should be convincing enough. Uh, so don't get fooled by what you, what you watch online yeah. and the liberal propaganda. There's no doubt that's their homeland. Amen. Why? Because out of, you can argue legally, historically, philosophically, who cares? The point is what, the, what say it? The scripture. Amen. And we know what the Bible says about that. So there's, there's no way you can get around this. There's absolutely no way you can get around this. Okay, so now we're the Jewish people, they've been wandering and they've been suffering all this time. Remember, Europe, they suffered so much persecution in Catholic countries. But also, they, uh, what happened next is that they were moving into Russia and then the Jews suffered immense persecution in Russia as well. So this is on page 36. It's called The Pale of Settlement by Dr. Grady. The largest number of ghettoized Jews in Imperial Russia was in the Pale of Settlement. Pale from the Latin palace for stake or boundary. Catherine the Great created the Pale in 1791 as a buffer against further migration into her realm. Life in the... Uh, probably it's pronounced Shetetels, which is also known little towns, was unbearable at best. Scores succumbed to poverty and famine. The isolated living quarters also made them soft targets for anti-Semitic violence. The most effective slander throughout the diaspora was a blood libel, the claim that Jews murdered children to use their blood in religious rituals. Other historic charges included well poisoning and host desecration. The first pogrom occurred in 1821 in Odessa. Guess where? Modern Ukraine. Okay, but anyway, you, you pray and you go home and pray and think about why the Lord 
uh, why things are going on in Ukraine and the Lord has his hands there. But anyway, when 14 Jews were slain after the death of the Greek Orthodox patriarch Gregory V, the word entered common English usage following the wave of anti-Jewish riots throughout southwestern Russia from 1881 to 1884. The catalyst for this latter outbreak, comprising over 200 incidents, was the assassination of Tsar Alexander II, for which the Jews were falsely implicated. Ironically, the reality of this dreary existence was <coughs> Fiddler on the Roof. That's when that play came out, for some of you who didn't know. It was nominated for 10 Tony Awards, winning nine, including Best Musical, Score, Book, Direction, and Choreography. Uh, let's see right here. The historical context for this demonstration was the 1903, uh, 1903 Kishinev pogrom where 50 Jews were slain and 500 wounded <coughs> on the basis of another false accusation. This one being the murder of a Russian Orthodox youth. An article in the New York Times reported the mob was led by priests and the general cry, kill the Jews, was taken up. The Jews, wholly unaware, were slaughtered like sheep. The scenes of horror attending this massacre are beyond description. Babies were literally torn to pieces by the frenzied and bloodthirsty mob. The police made no attempt to check the terror. At sunset, the streets were piled with corpses and wounded. Those who could fled in terror, the city is now practically deserted of Jews. That's, that was life within the pale. So this is the Russian Orthodox, a branch from Rome, right? See, the, uh, it was always the enemy. It was always the enemy of God. Okay, now, first fruits of Zionism right here. Now, uh, I'm not going to, man, I want to read everything, but I don't have time. So, the first fruits of Zionism, which is very interesting, Napoleon Bonaparte, he was the guy who was planning and discussing about starting a nation for Israel, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Napoleon himself. So, believe it or not. But obviously, it didn't really go through. But you can read pages 40 all the way through page uh, 43 on that, and then you can see... Uh, what Dr. Grady, Grady describes about the first fruits of Zionism. In the wake, uh, page 42, in the wake of Russia's violent pogroms and the restrictive May laws imposed by Alexander III on May 15, 1882, the Jews mostly fled westward. However, a battered but committed remnant would travel south to Eretz Yisrael. So their epoch-making odyssey became the vanguard of modern Zionism calling themselves Hoveve Zion, lovers of Zion. Several student activist groups formed to create agricultural colonies in Palestine. The Bil uh, Bilu Society, which is also known House of Jacob, sporting a membership of 500 students, fostered the prototype of the communal experiment known as the Kibbutz Gathering. So notice right here, it's always been going on. Zionism as well. In 1882, 10 enthusiasts from Kharkov, led by Z.D. Levantine, planted the community of Rishon Le Zion, which is first to Zion, on a purchase track of 835 acres. The colonies of Rosh Pana, Zikron Jaakob, and Yesod HaMa'ala quickly followed in Galilee. W w they didn't tell you that. They didn't tell you that, that of these communities that were planted in Palestine during that time. Unfortunately, nearly all of the initial settlements were planted in malarial districts as they afforded the best irrigation. Thus, many first-generation pioneers succumbed to the dread disease, known as the scourge of the Middle East. Yet the survivors fought on bravely. How about this? Chaim Chisin it describes a hardship. I did not have the faintest idea of what it was all about. Still, I raised my hoe and started bringing it down on the earth. In a little while, blisters developed. My hands started bleeding, and the pain was so excruciating that I had to lay down the hoe. But I immediately felt ashamed of myself. Is this how you mean to show that the Jews are capable of manual labor? I asked myself, are you really able to come through this test? I took new heart and picked up the hoe again, and despite the stinging pain, I hoed for two solid hours though it nearly killed me. 
To the settlers, uh, end of quote, to the settlers' relief, the swamps, uh, let's see right here, the swamps were eventually drained, causing the death rate to decline. However, conditions outside the Yishuv were far worse. Jewish mortality from 1922 to 1925 was 13.62 per thousand. How about that? The cause for this disparity was self-evident. The Fellahin villages were literally overrun with filth and disease. There were massive dunghills, etc. Okay, but uh, that's uh, everything of the struggles and the life of the Jewish people that they don't really tell you. Now, finally comes the Balfour Declaration. And this was from Secretary Author James Balfour. And if you heard that name, he's part of the round table. And this is to Lord Lionel Walter, uh, Walter Rothschild. So remember, Rothschilds also joined the round table. So this is the, uh, the momentous uh, draft that followed. Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Yours, author James Balfour. So that's a huge declaration, the Balfour Declaration. Now let's cover uh, the issues here about why were there elites involved in this. Uh, isn't this disturbing, Pastor, to you that elites are involved in this? Oh, of course it's disturbing because if God, if the Jews are going to get their homeland back, don't think the devil's going to sit quiet and let it run. He's going to put his hands in there, put elites, his satanic forces in there to accomplish a feat. So let me explain it right here. Dr. Grady writes on page 106, the, uh, the last incentive is as sorry as the previous one was sentimental, yet the same players are involved. To begin, the Balfour Declaration was not even penned by Mr. Balfour. Mm. Professor Quigley, remember that guy who's exposing the round table? Confirms, quote, this declaration, which is always known as the Balfour Declaration, should rather be called the Milner Declaration. Since Milner was the actual draftsman and was apparently its chief supporter in the war cabinet. End of quote. But... Keep, keep hearing this. According to Dr. Quigley, the news was first publicized on Ju July 21st, 1937, seven years after Balfour's death. When Colonial Secretary of State William Orms, uh, Ormsby Gore informed the House of Commons, quote, the draft as originally put up by Lord Balfour was not the final draft approved by the War Cabinet. Okay, then who? The particular draft, the senitude by the War Cabinet and afterward by the Allied governments and by the United States and finally embodied in the mandate happens to have been drafted by Lord Milner. He admits that. The actual final draft had to be issued in the name of the Foreign Secretary, but the actual draftsman was Lord Milner. End of quote. Then in 2000, 23 years after Quigley's death, William Rubinstein, a professor at Aberystwyth University in Wales and former president of the Jewish Historical Society of England, asserted in his book that the true author was Leopold Amory, assistant secretary to the war cabinet. Finally, to, conf uh, to further confuse things, there are two Balfour declarations, not one. The latter dated 1926, confirming the autonomous status of the varied dominions within the British Empire. So what does Dr. Grady say? God is not the author of confusion. That's the thing. God is not the author of confusion. So as you sift through this confusion, the Lord is not in that, you must understand. So then what do we know? So this is what we do know. All right. First of all, there are members involved in the declaration that are around table. Nathan Rothschild, Lord Milner and obviously Mr. Balfour himself. 
And then there's Leopold Amory, Lord Curzon, etc. Dr. Grady writes on page 108, while British Jewry interpreted the declaration as a mandate for statehood, Milner, listen, Milner concealed his private interpretation behind a cloak, cloak of ambiguity. What is it? Addressing the House of Lords on June 27, 1923, he admitted that the real purpose for importing Jews into Palestine was not that they get their homeland. Money. Quote, I am not speaking of the policy which is advocated by the extreme Zionists, which is a totally different thing. I believe we have only to go on steadily with the policy of the Balfour Declaration as we have ourselves interpreted it in order to see great material progress in Palestine. If there's one thing you know about elites, it's not that people get their homeland back. Mm -hmm. Come on. To think that this is the real conspiracy, that Jews get their homeland back, you're, you're funny. You're too funny for words. There's one thing that elites want, it's not these Jews get their homeland back or people get their homeland back or that the poor black minorities get their equal rights. Yeah. You know what it is? It's all power and money. That's right, brother. So why is it that importing Jews to Palestine will help with their great material progress? Because it says right here, the dissolution uh, of the Ottoman Empire also served to unleash the potential for a measure of Arab nationalism. Arabism as the Muslim equivalent of Zionism uh, Milner's political vision of a British-based commonwealth of nations would therefore have to incorporate a league of, not Jewish states, Arab states. Thus, in that same speech, he declared, quote, I believe in the independence of the Arab countries, which they owe to us and which they can only maintain with our help I look forward to an Arab federation. You see what they want? See, it's, uh, it's Mr. White Man behind the scenes being president of the United States, pretending to, control, uh, pretending to support the poor minorities because you need Mr. White Man's help right here. See this? See, do you see the game being played right now? Do you see the game being played right now? People don't understand. They're so blind. They're so blind. All right. Of, uh, of course, looking down the road, the only problem was the politically incorrect reality of racial inequality. The group believed that a proportion influx of Jewish initiative and business would invigorate Palestine. See, that's why. Because they know those Jews, they can make money, that they can work, they can thrive the economy. Thereby offering the Arab world an appealing front door to Western ideas. That way they can infiltrate their Western ideology there, the round table. The editor of the round table, John Dove, wrote this. If the Arab belongs to the Mediter Mediterranean, as T.E. Lawrence insists, see that Lawrence of Arabia is garbage. That's that propaganda that's promoting the round table ideology too. But the liberal Hollywood, they all give it five star ratings, the top ten movies by, uh, you know, uh, Ro Ro Robert or Eper, whatever his name is, the, the critics. You see all this? Elitist propaganda. Brainwashing. All right, let me I explain T.E. Lawrence again. If the Arab belongs to the Mediterranean, as T.E. Lawrence insists, we should do nothing to stop him getting back to it. That's the editor of the round table who said that. Personally, I don't see the slightest harm in Jews coming to Palestine under reasonable conditions. They are the Arabs' cousins, and if Zionism brings capital and labor, which will enable industries to start, it will add to the strength of the larger unit, which someday is going to include Palestine. But they must be content to be part of such a potential unit. What does that mean? The round table, elitist plan, is a two-state solution. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they want, two-state solution. As Dove's last comment infers, the group had no intention of ever allowing Jewry to secure legal status. Provide economic stimulus for Arab growth? Yes. Attain independence? Never. With reference to Milner's speech, Quigley notes, this is important, quote, this is what Milner wanted. He then went on to say that he felt that Palestine would require a permanent mandate 
and under that condition could become a national home for the Jews, could take as many Jewish immigrants as a country could economically support, but must never become a Jewish state. Did they tell you that in truth or you? Did Alex Jones ever talked about that before? The, the info wars and so much. They don't tell you this. They don't tell you this stuff. How about that? This is interesting. They mentioned right here about the Jews and the Arabs. He, uh, he, in page 109, he closes his remarks by, by recalling that mysterious desert allurement, affirming that although the powers behind the declaration were non-anti-Semitic, they were decidedly pro-Arab. Their, fe quote, their feeling against anti-Semitism was on the whole remote and academic. On the other hand, as with most upper class English, the elites, their feeling for the Arabs was somewhat more personal. How about that? And then you see these so-called truthers siding with poor Palestinians that they'll call it and going against the Jews. I wonder who's following the conspiracy. Who's the puppet on the string? People who get into replacement theology, anti-Semitic garbage, or you know the, the conspiracies behind Jews running the whole show and all that. They are so lost, they don't even know what's going on, that they're the puppets on the string. Amen. All right, then. Was that thorough enough? That should be thorough enough. I established that fact, all right? I established that fact, all right? Don't make me go scripture, because then we'll go two hours. You know that, all right? I got a whole playlist of videos just on scripture alone, all right? You just heard the history and everything, okay? That, that was more than thorough, more than enough. Okay, so we understand the history of the Jewish people. Now, the Dreyfus affair, what was that? The Dreyfus affair, unfortunately, that was a time when... Uh, the people were crucifying the Jews as being, uh, as being the ones responsible uh, in France of some kind of uh, problem that occurred and as a danger to their government. But later on, Dreyfus was exonerated. He was pardoned. They realized that he was innocent. So this Dreyfus affair was a really big fiasco in France, which caused them to distance further from the Vatican. Okay, so remember, France never got along with... Roman Catholic countries, right? So if you recall, let's fresh review before we continue on, all right? Fresh review. Remember way back then, Fran uh, France never got along with the Catholic Empire. You recall that, right? So France didn't get along with the Catholic Empires. Uh, Napoleon was conquered, all right? And then remember the European countries tried to get together and they did not like America. That was considered a, uh, a threat to them. So France and the European nations, as they continued on in time, Catholicism still had strongholds over there. But France was more distant uh, politically from the Catholic Church. Whereas the Holy Roman Empire, it was, remember, supposedly lost after Napoleon. But if you recall the Holy Roman Empire's terrain, it's Germany and Austria-Hungary. It's that center in Europe, you might recall, right? So then when the Holy Roman Empire lost its name, it became Germany and Austria-Hungary. These are the three big pivotal nations because that's what also was important in our past history with Napoleon, with the Catholic Empire uh, during Napoleon's conquest. So these three countries are extremely important. England and America, they're already their own history. The Lord's hand was on them. So they're never a part of this dark setup, praise the Lord. But during this time, they were all pray because they were all apostatizing. So this was all Catholic territory. But this one politically was more distant from the, uh, the new Holy Roman Empire, so to speak. So it's Germany, Austria, Hungary, and France. Well, the Catholic Church, they got involved with this Dreyfus affair. And because they were involved in that, where uh, it turned out that the Jew was a pardon, that Dreyfus was not actually uh, the guilty party, then... France got more upset at the Vatican because the Vatican was more anti-Semite. So this was becoming a big problem to them. All right, but anyways, let's uh, go to Frederick Widdowson's book, A Bible Believer's uh, Looks at World History. His book, page 341. And let's close it off here. All right, I cannot finish everything. Let's close it off here. In 1901, Eugenio Pacelli, a young priest in charge of pupils in... Seneca Convent in Rome 
was invited to become a part of the Pope's Secretariat of State. He will one day become Pope Pius XII. This is important. One of the most influential players in world politics. He's so important because this is where World War I comes out. First in the rise of Hitler and the Second World War, and then in the Cold War between the West, particularly in the United States and the Soviet Union. See, that Pope is important. So you're going to have to remember his name. He, at the age of 25, would personally carry the letter of condolence to King Edward VII of England on the occasion of the death of Queen Victoria. He's an important player. In 1904, he earned his doctorate, doing his thesis on an amazing subject, the nature of concordats or special treaties made between the Vatican and nation states. Leo XIII died at the age of nine, 93 in 1903, and Pope Pius X ruled it until 1914, setting the tone by defending the Roman Catholic Church from any attempts to compromise with the modern world. Be uh, what do they mean by the modern world? Well, it's because America was spreading out. English uh, was spreading out, but France with this atheism was spreading out as well. Priests and church authorities were reported for holding wrong beliefs such as Christian democracy or any questioning of the Pope's absolute authority in religious matters and removed from their positions. He is best known for the work that became the Code of Canon Law of 1917. The Code confirmed the absolute authority of the Pope. Pacelli was placed in charge of, of church state affairs in France. So he was placed in charge of church state affairs in France where anti-clericalism over the Jesuit influence in foreign affairs and the catastrophe of the Franco-Prussian War, Franco-Prussian War, okay, that time it's this territory, France, and then Prussian territories weren't getting along, was rampant. So Pacelli was during that time. In addition, the church was on the wrong side of the popular Dreyfus affair, insisting that the Jew was the criminal and should be punished on Devil's Island even beaten daily. When Dreyfus was exonerated, <laughs> the church came under attack by socialists. So obviously France didn't get along with them on that. A law was passed in 1901 forbidding priests to teach, forcing the Jesuits to close their schools. After the French government cut off diplomatic relations with the Vatican, a law was passed officially separating church from state in France. You think the Vatican is going to sit down and play nice after that? They don't. When France distanced themselves from the Vatican. And thus uh, we come, and I'll tell you, uh, the next conspiracy that the Jesuits supposedly, they did something to trigger World War I. And Pope Pius, his political affairs is what brought World War I anyways as well. Whatever it, it is, conspiracy or, uh, or what is known in history from Pius' interference, it doesn't change the fact Catholic influence contributed to World War I. Catholic influ uh, influence contributed to World War I. So we're, we come to Serbia, there's an assassination, and then World War I starts to blow up right here. And then we'll see what those Jesuits do. Those Jesuits, uh, they don't sit still. They're not done. So then they did something in World War I. Also, let's rewind to the past. Rewind to the past. Remember that split with the Byzantine Empire, the Western Roman Empire, uh, uh, the Western Roman Empire from Eastern? Mm -hmm. Byzantine Empire from the Roman Catholic? Their enemy was the Greek Orthodox Church. Yeah. Supposedly, after World War I, the Jesuits finally, after centuries, launched their plan to pay back against their other half. And that's where you get the communists finally coming to the scene to take over Russia. Oh, wow. And we'll see how the Jesuits played wow. behind that and why communism was born in Russia. And don't forget the round table. They had a plan with that one as well. Next time in your world history class. All right, so we'll see what's going on. And then you know what happens after that. World War II is not far away. All right, let's start off with a word of prayer. Uh, let's end with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. We're more aware of our history, what's going on in our world, and that we don't follow the, the tendency of human nature like a machine, but follow your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.